Thank you so much for joining us, Philip Kotler. This is truly an honor. It's mutual. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start with, uh, you know, the book you wrote in 1967, which is really a, a, a book that is, uh, you know, celebrated uh, by everybody who has learned marketing, uh, marketing management. Uh, the book that you wrote then, how much of it do you think is still holds true today? And how much of it is redundant? Yes, um, I believe that the book has in it uh, the basics that create a marketing cap capacity and capability. And um, I wouldn't get rid of any of that part because it's all about how do you satisfy and win and grow customers. Sure. And that hasn't changed. However, um, each edition, and it comes out every three years, mm -hmm. brings in the latest thinking. Absolutely. So the if I have two people, one who has the 1967 copy of the book and is doing marketing and depending on the 67 copy and the other one's using my 14th edition, right. I know I will bet on the 14th edition. Right. For example, when a topic like branding starts up, in 1967, I only gave two pages to That's branding. True. Yeah, that was the mention of it. Now yeah. it is um, in every chapter. Same thing with social media. Uh, maybe five years ago, the book had mention of social media. Now every chapter has examples of digital and social media. Mr. Cotler, you've also seen, you know, the, the marketing evolution, um, which has come a long way in its entire journey. Uh, and today is a day where almost everybody is talking about uh, the rise of digital. And, uh, and, you know, marketers are more and more focusing on the digital piece than really the brand piece because of the fact that there's just so much pressure. Um, do you think it's uh, too much is made out of this medium uh, or is it being given its due? Uh, no, I, I think that uh, it is being underdone rather than overdone, okay. although it seems to be overdone in some minds mm -hmm. because um, many companies are still hesitant to shift into more use of digital and social. Sure. It's just amazing. Uh, how there's an inertia mm. in companies to just do what they've been doing. Mm. For example, does it make sense to spend as much on 30-second commercials uh, that cost you so much money in the face of evidence that people don't even want to watch commercials anymore? They go to the bathroom when they take uh, place. They want to be more on the computer and doing the Internet and, and doing active things so why do we continue spending so much that way when we should shift some of our budget to Facebook and, Goodyear, uh, and uh, Google and so on? So I think that um, we're still underdoing the digital. Okay. Okay. So give, give me a sense in terms of prediction uh, going forward in terms of the whole um, the spends mix. Yes. How much would be traditional? How much would be digital? Would it be 50-50? Yeah, no, let's uh, say first where, what has been happening and where it's going. Uh, one of the signs of, of a smart company is not to throw a lot of money at digital without knowing how to use it. So yeah. take 10% of your budget, put it into digital, but put it in the hands of a team of very capable net netizens. A netizen is someone who grew up with the net, a young millennial person or earlier. Give them the money and say, play around with it. And we're going to give you more if it shows that it's working maybe another 5%, but if it's not working, we're going to wait to watch how it works for other companies. Sure. We're going to learn from others as well as ourselves. Now, how far will it go? Well, at Procter & Gamble, they're telling me 30%. that depending on the product, they are now at a range of 25% to 35% right. being spent on digital. Sure. Okay. By the way, I think they're still growing their total advertising budget because they don't want to let go of the branding built by the 30-second commercial. Right. I think it will go to 50-50. If I ask you to look at the marketing function and how it's evolved over the years within an organization, right, and the kind of prominence uh, it used to have or it has currently, as the case may be, do you think the marketing function actually has progressed within an organization or actually regressed? Well, no, it is uh, progressing. Um, and let me tell you what the evolution has been. We used to have only a sales force in the company. There was no re need for marketing and no one knew what it meant. Mm. Except sales forces realized they needed some extra people in the sales force, one group to sort of do some uh, brochures and ads, 
course, why ask the salesman to do that? Sure. They're not capable. Sure. Some to find hot leads right. and someone who would uh, just do marketing research to help the salesman. Mm. After a while, those three should maybe make another department. So initially, it's called the marketing department. Over time, the group was known mostly for communications, not, not deciding what products the company should make, right. Simple, and not even involved in being asked, mm -hmm. why are we making that product? The marketing people were best known uh, for 30-second commercials. God, that's true. So even there were CEOs who were engineers and they took over a company or created a company, and they said, I don't like marketing. I don't know why I need it, but I know I need some promotion. Mm -hmm. So that became the one P that got noticed until some CEOs started to say, I need four Ps. I want a marketing plan, product, price, place, promotion. Okay, then some said at a higher level, before you do product, price, price place, and promotion, who are, who's our customer? That led to segmentation, targeting, and positioning. What are the customer segments? Which one should we target? And what do we say about ourselves? And then it still left marketing as a group that was more a cost center that would do research about the consumer, would try to find some insights into the consumer, but it wasn't affecting the company's strategy. In fact, the name of the head of marketing was vice president of marketing, who was running a nice organization with some services that it was selling to it within the company. Now we have a different title. We call the person the chief marketing officer, and that's very much pro uh, progressive because it says, we need a chief. A, a marketing also should be a chief. It's not enough to have a financial chief officer and a, and a technology chief officer. So finally, in the United States, there's now about 3,000 CMOs. And they sit with the other executives to influence decisions in the interest of satisfying customers. So there's been a lot of change. Just when you meet chief marketing officers, or even CEOs who talk about their brand ideology, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all of them talk about a particular cause, right? They're very purpose-driven in their marketing, and that's really the new lingo. Whether it's PNG, whether it's HUL, you name it, they all have some kind of leaning towards some purpose, and that's called purpose-driven marketing. Uh, so every time you interview one of these CMOs, you, it almost sounds like you're talking to an NGO. Okay. You know, so you, you're kind of confused as to, you know, okay, so for instance, HUL talks about sustainability. Every aspect of marketing or their product is related to sustainability, and they almost sound like an NGO. And I've said that to, uh, you know, Keith Weed several times. Uh, have, have CMOs in this, you know, great, um, uh, you know, attempt to try and uh, look good, do good, to build brand goodwill, uh, forgotten that they actually need to sell their products. No, they haven't forgotten it. That's how they're going to sell more of it. You really think so? Yeah. Here's the thing. I keep telling companies, you're making soap, but what's your higher purpose? Well, to help people be cleaner and not catch germs and all kinds of... Always think of whatever you're doing. You know, you're not just laying bricks to build a, uh, a place. You're, you're building a cathedral. You're honoring God or something. You know, put it at a level that is inspirational. And what, what is that about? You know, you got employees all the time doing routine work. We want them to feel inspired by what they're doing. Look, a, a person who's a farmer might say, well, I'm just making corn. No, no, you're feeding the world. So some of this um, idea it's not just about sustainability, it's every company should try to look for an elevated view of how they are making a difference in the world. First of all, most of their, and you think most of their effort is, is to show they're either better than a competitor, or better and different than a competitor, or making a difference in the world. I like that third, that's marketing 3.0. Right. Um, so you're, you, so Basically, you're saying that, that consumers are really interested in knowing what is, the, what is uh, you know, the company ethos and will then buy the product. If they're educated consumers, it turns out that maybe someone who is poor and just wants the lowest price for something 
it won't, he or she wouldn't even know if the company is responsible exactly. uh, for social things. Yeah. But as more and more people get educated, and let's take a country as an example, let's take, everyone in Sweden is educated. Okay. You know, Sweden, Swedish people would not buy from a company that isn't practicing sustainability. Mm -hmm. There's no choice okay. in Sweden. You better practice it. Um, in the United States, maybe it's like that, but not all the way. Sure. And maybe in India, Nobody maybe cares. five to 10, 15% yeah. will care about yeah. it. Maybe it's premature to, to go spiritual and to go higher purpose for most of your market. It depends. There are some products that are selling in highly educated markets, True. and there it will work. Several uh, you know, CEOs of holding companies, advertising, marketing conglomerates that you meet, be it the Martin Sorrells or the Maurice Levies of the world, or it actually be chief marketing officers, uh, one of the key grouses that they put on the table is the fact that there is just too much interference from procurement. Right, from the procurement division of the company. Yeah. And uh, this has really come to light after the grand, the recession that we've all just seen, that we're just kind of coming out of. But because of that, of, because of the kind of pressure that marketing has on it to either slash budgets or just become less of a cost center, they find that their powers have somewhat been diminished. The, the, but whose powers have been diminished? The marketing teams. Oh. The problem that is facing uh, marketers is that the CEO along with the chief financial officer, want to a measure of Roma. Roma is return on marketing investment. Uh, ro re, Romi or Romai, it depends on whether it's return on marketing assets or on investment. Mm -hmm. And those numbers don't exist yet. And what if you're getting a zero return? Maybe we don't, shouldn't spend money on marketing. Maybe if marketing is largely promotional money, use the money to make a better product. Don't use it to just uh, sell the existing products. Sure. So there will be all kinds of shifts going on in, in how much money marketing should get. Right. This is why I urge the CMO to become a friend of the CFO. Okay. Because the CFO is your enemy sure. in marketing. Right. Because he or she keeps telling the CEO, we're spending too much money on marketing. That's true. Now, if the two go down, to have lunch together, and work out a metric system that will satisfy the CFO, he may become your best ally. True. <laughs> so. Well, I'm sure, that the, I'm, I'm sure Indian marketers are paying heed to what you're saying. But, you know, I want to talk about um, the CMO today. Yes. Uh, and the fact is most CMOs today are not net netizens, right? That's correct. They are not um, digital citizens. Uh, and the fact that they have to suddenly, um, you know, take on so much is a little bit intimidating. They're doing it, but they really do, they're not very comfortable yeah. with it. It's and not their natural it. leading. They so, admit that they, yeah, yeah. they aren't adequately trained in digital. Given that, do you think, uh, given the complex landscape we live in, do you think CMOs should be as old as they are while running these companies? I've been predicting that uh, marketing will be run by younger and younger people in the future. I can imagine the CMO of a company being 20 years old. Yeah? Yeah. How fast do you see that happen? I don't, uh, I have no measures of sure. what's really happening to the average age of the people running marketing. I think the average age of the people in marketing will go down. Mm. And whether the top person is going to, uh, remember, experience is very important too. Mm -hmm. Experience could, is something that the younger people don't have. You don't want to throw it away unless it's blocking what the younger people should be doing. So um, I would say that um, uh, the average, uh, that marketing departments will, as, let me bring in as an answer to your question what we mean by big data. Yeah. Big data is so important now we are at a point which we never thought we would be at where we can, we know a lot about any individual customer. Mm -hmm. The media they use, the products they buy, when they buy these products, and so on. And that's all in big data. Now, big data is going to be the repository of, of, of our insights. There, if we can look at trends in big data, if we can look at segments in big data, we will have clues to how to change our price, our product, and so on and so forth. So marketing will become much more 
scientific. We're moving from art to science. By the way, I don't want to use, lose creativity. Mm -hmm. The two most important things in marketing is to have left brain people and right brain people. Right brain is used for creative uh, people, left brain for an, uh, analytical people. Both are important. But what's getting very popular now is hiring people who are good at marketing analytics mm -hmm. so they can look at big data and draw insights about the customer. So basically what you're saying is that marketing will become a lot more geeky. Yes, <laughs> right. Uh, and, and that's bad for people who just start into marketing because they had a course in advertising and sure. thought, I want to learn how to do some ads. Right, it's right. A, it gets a different flavor. So you talked about the 30-second commercial, but you know, thanks to the internet where the inventory is unlimited, um, you know, we've seen uh, uh, brands, uh, you know, do storytelling, which is as long as like four minutes, four and a half minutes, right? Because there is no end. Um, and the thing is, storytelling these days is such a big concept that uh, sometimes it's such a beautiful story. And sure, I'm entertained, yeah. but I don't know what you're selling, right? Uh, and that seems to be uh, a, a problem of sorts where you, get the, you strike a balance between selling and also telling me a beautiful story. Yeah, um, right. Do you think marketers today are getting a bit too carried away with, you know... Um, well, they shouldn't forget that um, the story should reinforce the interest in buying the product and sharing something about being touched by the company for that story. It, it should always be a touching story, heartfelt, appealing to emotions. Marketing 1.0, mm. yes, Tide does clean better. Marketing 2.0 is the love of a mother for a child and giving her the best mm -hmm. and so on. So, and marketing 3.0? Huh? Marketing 3.0 would be showing that the mother is doing more for the child than just holding the child, having a vision of how that girl or boy will grow up and planning to help them realize their aspirations, whatever it is. Your point is well taken, that the story should really be adding an interest in touching and being part of the company in some way. And that may be missed by... Now, there is a new thing happening called, called content management. Yeah. And now, that is really developing material that is not selling material. Exactly. Facilitating the ability to do content connection with your customers. Sure. See, most of your customers aren't going to connect with you until the next purchase cycle. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing that uh, Nike has done. Nike was worried that no one buy, talk, thinks about Nike until their shoe wears out and they need a new pair. Nike wants you to be uh, close to Nike all the time. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they put a chip in your shoe and now you are getting measures on how fast you run and how far you run. And uh, it, you can send that to information to friends who are running too. Nike's on my mind every day. So companies have this problem. If people don't buy our product every two years, they forget about us. Sure. Can I connect with them more continuously? And content is one of those sure, ways. Sure. I want to talk to you about, uh, you know, what marketing 4.0 will look like going forward if we are currently in the marketing 3.0 phase. Yeah. Now remember, 1.0 means that you're doing the kind of job proving that your product is superior to other competitors. Uh, but doing it rationally, no emotion or window dressing. 2.0 is to do it in a way that realizes that people like to humanize what it, whatever's involved and you're tapping on emotions. 3.0, you go further and you say there's reasons to be compassionate too. There are some people can't even afford the product. There's um, uh, the planet is being hurt by some practices, and let's care about that. That's 3.0. People have asked me, aren't you going to write a book on 4.0? I mm -hmm. said, well, maybe if I ever think of what it might be. And, I don't, and, I, and the answer is I don't know how you go beyond um, the 1, 2, and 3, because the 3 is the, how, beyond compassion. What is there? And then I realized what it is. It's Mas Abraham Maslow's uh, need hierarchy. A famous psychologist who had a hierarchy of needs, starting with, if we can't meet our basic needs, if we're starving, we don't uh, worry about any other needs. Sure. We just got to eat. The need to belong, belonging, that's satisfied. Maybe that it's either second or third. 
and as you go up. Maslow's top need was not thought about that much. It was self-actualization. Self-actualization means you have a, a dream about yourself and your capacity and what you would like to be and, and become. Self-aspiration is involved in that. And many companies uh, at 4.0 would think maybe, how can I help people realize their aspirations better? Wow. It's too new to formulate, but it's yeah. going to happen. So would you then say that a chief marketing officer in an organization is best poised to become the CEO? Well, I'm trying to say that, yes. Yeah, yeah that they, that now, if some other condition exists, and I'll tell you what the other condition is, it all comes, up, it's very much to my, like my telling all of my students, if you really want to rise to the top, don't only do marketing. Do a major in marketing and finance. Because as you get higher up in an organization, more talk is about how much money are you making sure. and about all the financial analysis and so on. So if that CMO who gave his company or her, she gave the company great ideas uh, and, and have, has more ideas, ideas like Richard Bramson has ideas and all the time, should be the CMO, but a CMO should also know finance. So to the extent that that person has that side too, uh, it will be a very strong uh, president or C CMO, CEO, I mean. You know, one of the last questions I want to put to you is agencies are going through a really rough time right now. Yes. Because of the kind of infidelity they're seeing yeah. with uh, you know, their, their partners, uh, with brands really being quite uh, promiscuous these days. Uh, how do you see the agency structure going forward? Uh, the old, uh, you know, one creative agency, one media agency, and that whole marriage of sorts, is that, you know, extremely passe and out of world? Well, any agency that wants to survive um, and that is large pro probably should offer the customer, the company, whatever it wants. And what the customer wants is a mix of um, help on digital and uh, traditional. Yeah. And here's the problem that I worry about that the money is more made on traditional. Yes. I mean, well, isn't that the easiest life to just create a commercial Absolutely. and then get rent from it? <laughs> uh, and so they, they may tell their client, you know, you really need 80% uh, uh, you know, traditional. In their hearts, they know that they don't need that much traditional. So you got to work with your agency to get at the truth about what will optimize their, the impact. And it may be a mix that isn't a very profitable mix for the agency. Sure. Mr. Kotler, three key messages to the Indian marketers who are watching this interview. Uh, one, uh, marketing is um, a, a force for good and used in the right way. And it will be changing all the time. So don't uh, depend on a textbook written in 1967. But take the 14th edition, which will bring you up to date. And also, um, uh, work well with all the other uh, functions in a company. Please especially become a friend with the Vice President of Finance and uh, get to know the CEO and uh, who needs more education as well in what marketing is so he is not simply a 1P CEO. Sure. Thank you so much Mr. Kotler. This has truly been a pleasure. My pleasure too. Thank you.